good evening. Uh, I'm Theo Brown, director of the McClendon Scholar Program at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. We're delighted to have you join us for this webinar uh, that will feature the showing of spiritual audacity, the Abraham Joshua Heschel story. Um, as you may know, New York Avenue Presbyterian is one of the most historic churches in Washington, D.C., and we've been our same location uh, near the White House since before the Civil War. Because of our long history and strategic location, there have been many famous events that happen in uh, or around uh, our church. Uh, and tonight, um, we're reminded of one of those events. As we celebrate the life of Rabbi Heschel, we at New York Avenue Presbyterian are reminded of an historic moment when he and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in our sanctuary at a highly publicized meeting organized by clergy and laity concerned about the war in Vietnam. And you see a picture now of Dr. King uh, at the pulpit in our sanctuary speaking at that meeting in 1967. And in the right of the photo there, you'll see Rabbi Heschel. There's a close-up that gives you a, a little better sense of him. It's a bit blurry, but you can certainly see uh, his distinctive look there on the, on the podium. Um, this meeting in January of 1967 marked one of the turning points of against the Vietnam War as both Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel spoke eloquently about the need for people of faith to oppose the war. Now, in addition to this photo, we have an audio tape of Rabbi Heschel speaking, uh, making remarks that evening, and we'll be playing an excerpt from that uh, at the close of the program. Now, as we begin, I want to offer a brief invocation uh, taken from the longer prayer that Rabbi Heschel offered at that gathering 54 years ago. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we confess our sins. We are ashamed at the inadequacy of our anguish for the suffering of others. We are a generation that has lost the capacity for outrage. We are assembled here to remind ourselves that in a free society, all are involved in what some are doing. Some are guilty, all are responsible, and there is a need for repentance at many levels. Amen. Most of you are familiar with the regular programs we host through the McClendon Scholar Program and likely have attended one or more of our webinars that we've had during the past year. Since July, we've been thankful to be able to present webinars with such notable scholars as Reverend James Lawson, uh, E.J. Dion, Corinna Gore, James Foreman Jr., and Judy Fentress Williams. Um, we want to share our website for you in the chat, uh, and also we'll mention it again later, so you can learn more about our programs, and if you wish, access any recordings that may be of interest to you from previous scholars, and you see that website now uh, in the chat function. Speaking of past programs, this is the fourth time we have organized the McClendon Scholar Program around a film produced by Martin Doblemeyer and Journey Films. During the past few years, we have had programs in our sanctuary with hundreds of people that were built around films on Reinhold Niebuhr, Howard Thurman, and Dorothy Day. This is our first time showing one of Martin's films as part of a webinar, and we're pleased to be able to do that. I will give a fuller introduction of Martin Doblemeyer after the film at the same time that I introduce our special guest, Dr. Susanna Heschel. So I just wanna give a brief summary of what we're gonna do this evening and then we'll get started with the film. The film is just under an hour long and after it is over, we'll have a conversation with Martin and Susanna. That will include at about 8.30 p.m. when we'll begin a question period where our two panelists will answer any questions that you who are watching submit to them. I hope you'll be able to stay for all of the program up through the question period after the presentation part ends at 8.30. 
As I mentioned earlier, we have a recording of Rabbi Heschel speaking at that meeting in 1967, and we'll play an excerpt from that uh, at our benediction, and I think you will want to hear that. It is very powerful. One reminder is to use the Q&A function, and you see that at the bottom of the, the uh, webinar screen there, um, to use the Q&A function only for questions you want to pose about the film or anything relating to it. Now, if you want to make a general comment or something you observe, put that in the chat function. That will also be on. Um, and let's reserve Q&A for specific questions. As you'll see, and maybe you've learned by now at other webinars, when you're in the Q&A function, you can also click to show you like a question, and that will help us to see which ones are most important uh, to answer given that we won't be able to get probably to all the questions that come in. All right, with all of that in mind, uh, it's now time to view the 2021 Wilbur Award winner for Best Religious Documentary, Spiritual Audacity, the Abraham Joshua Heschel story. We welcome you now to a conversation about the film and uh, about Rabbi Heschel's life and work. So we're going to talk for a few minutes here together with our two guests, and then later we'll take some of your questions. So if you have questions, type them into the Q&A box. Again, any general comments in the chat. But if you have a question you'd like to address to Martin Doblemeyer or Susanna Heschel, then uh, uh, type that into Q&A, and we'll get to those um, in a few moments. Um, I want to first introduce our two guests, um, and then I'll invite first Martin into the conversation, and then Susanna will join us um, after that. Um, Martin Doblemeyer is the founder and president of Journey Films. Uh, he has degrees in religious studies and broadcast journalism, and had used that training to produce and direct more than 30 films focused on religion, faith, and spirituality. Uh, in addition to some films I mentioned earlier that we have shown in the McClendon Scholar Program, he's also produced films on Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Thomas Jefferson, as well as ones that look at the role of chaplains in our society and the Adventist movement. Um, I first met Martin about 15 years ago when I did some community education work around his film, The Power of Forgiveness and have been a fan of his work ever since that time. Susanna Heschel is the Eli M. Black Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College. She has a BA from Trinity College, a Master of uh, Theological Studies from the Harvard Divinity School, and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She's been a visiting professor at, university, at uh, universities of Frankfurt, and Cape Town, as well as at Princeton. Uh, her scholarship focuses primarily on Jewish and Protestant thought during the 19th and 20th centuries, and she's the author of numerous publications, including The Aryan Jesus, Christian Theologians and the Bible in Nazi Germany, and Abraham Geiger and the Jewish Jesus, which was the winner of a National Book Award. She's currently a Guggenheim Fellow and is writing a book among her other work she's doing on the history of European Jewish scholarship on Islam. So I want to invite Martin Doblemeyer to join me uh, first for a moment, and then we'll add uh, Susanna Heschel to the conversation in a few moments. Welcome, uh, Martin. Good to see you, and thank you for this. Uh, thank you for this great film. Um, let's start by telling us a little bit about this, why you wanted to make this film, and oh, why now? First of all, thank you so much, Theo, my friend, to have to have another event. It's you've been able to organize uh, four events now around the Prophetic Voices series, uh, th and this film on um, Abraham Joshua Heschel is the fourth in the series. And uh, I just want to thank uh, New York Avenue Presbyterian Church and the McClendon Scholar Program for hosting all four of the events. And so, um, why Heschel and why Heschel now? Uh, well, well, Heschel, like the other characters that we did these biographical films on, on Reinhold Niebuhr and Howard Thurman um, and Dorothy Day and now Abraham Heschel, 
all have a, a number of things in common that I think really make them just unforgettable characters. Number one, um, they're great writers. They're just great writers. And, and to read uh, Abraham Heschel is a joy. His writing is timeless. They're all grounded in their faith tradition, different as they are, all grounded in their faith tradition. And out of that faith tradition, felt a sense of being propelled into transformation of the world around them. So they weren't first radicals who decided to go off and make public and social statements. They were first people who were grounded in their faith tradition and saw from that how important it was for them to go forward. And I think also too, as you look at them, what they're all saying, and particularly Heschel, uh, is they're all saying that um, it's not just the religious leaders that are called to be responsible in the social and political arenas of our world. We spend a lot of time looking at the people who are in the front lines of the civil rights movement. We see Martin Luther King Jr. and the other leaders of the faith traditions there. But I think what Heschel's message is fundamentally is that we're all called, we're all sons of prophets and daughters of the saints. And as a result of that, we all have a responsibility that we bear to take our faith tradition and to go out and make the world a better place to live. Were there any particular surprises for you as you made the film? Anything you learned about Rabbi Heschel you hadn't known before or that was different than you thought? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Yes, I mean, I, I have to say that we look now in 50 years, it's nearly 50 years since the passing of, of Abraham Heschel. And um, we tend to filter out a lot of the conflict and the challenges that he faced in his life. Uh, we'll see later on, we'll hear later on the, the talk that he gave in 1967, uh, the talk at your church at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in the, in the throes of the Vietnam War. It's hard to imagine from this distance and as history has gone back to now to revisit all that, that commotion that was happening in the 1960s and 70s around the Vietnam War, how much, how much pushback someone like an Abraham Heschel and Martin Luther King would have received as a result of engaging, having the courage to stand up and say that, to say what they felt as though they were compelled as, as faith people to speak about. I mean, I, I, I think there's a wonderful line that he offers in his presentation at New York Avenue Presbyterian in 1967. He says that we're both shocked and dismayed as people of faith and what our country, I meaning America is doing at this time. And yet at the same time, he took a lot of heat as a result of that. So I think that's, that's, that was one of the shocking realities for me, but also as I was watching the film tonight and I have a chance now to go back, I've watched it now 50 times, I watch it now 51st time and I'm thinking, well, what did I learn tonight? And, and I thought of what, what ease and grace uh, Heschel is able to take God's position in all of this. I mean, we're so preoccupied with looking at it from humanity's position to God, what we need, what we've failed to do, all the chaos that's going on around us. But what Heschel, I think, did time and time again is to see us from God's point of view. And that's, uh, that was just a, a wonderful gift. It, I mean, uh, in the film, Shai Hell talks about the fact that Heschel came to believe that God wanted to be worshipped in all these different forms. That's looking again at us from God's point of view. And again, I mean, throughout the course of the prophets, it's God's looking at us and creating expectations for us. And so that's another thing that I think both from a poetic and from a theological point of view, Heschel's able to give us God's view of us as humanity. And I think that's the greatest gift. I'd like to welcome uh, Susanna Heschel, have her come in and join us for this uh, conversation. Uh, so glad to have you with us. Tonight, Susanna, good to see you in the film. And now we get to see you live and to talk with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So just say a little bit about what it's like for you to view this film. Um, I'm, you haven't probably seen it as much as Martin has, but I'm sure you have. But what insights come up for you as you see this review of your father's life? Any particular things that stand out in, in, in the film we've just seen? Well, I think the film is wonderful. And I thank you, Martin, for making it. I think the uh, origin of the film goes back to a lunch we had at the airport, at Reagan National Airport one day, when I actually suggested that you make this film. And you were, you were a little surprised, but I think you did a great job. It's always interesting for me to see what kinds of, uh, what aspects of my father people bring out in, in this film, of course, but uh, in people's writings about him. And uh, there's so many different aspects to my father's life. And he lived in so many different places and wrote important books in four different languages. 
and he lived through some of the most tumultuous years of Jewish history. So there's still more, and Martin could make another two or three films about my father and have much more to say about him. So I appreciate, I appreciate the perspective and, and bringing my father's ideas to a wider public. That's wonderful. And I think people who watch your film, Martin, are going to read my father's books. And as you yourself have said, be inspired by his words. His words are so beautiful. Now, as a professor of Jewish studies yourself, in many ways you've done and continue to do similar work to your father. Um, was it always clear to you that you wanted to do that, follow in his footsteps, or did there come a particular time where you decided you wanted to be a scholar also of Jewish studies? Well, <laughs> so first of all, I, I grew up in the Middle Ages. You have to understand that. So when I was growing up, there was no such thing as a woman professor. And not really. I mean, there were maybe there were some vaguely somewhere, but my father's rare. was rare. My father's colleagues were men. And, and people would say to me, uh, for example, someone said, well, you should take chemistry in high school. It will help you with your cooking. But the idea of having a profession, no. And my parents were very, very liberal. And they said to me, you definitely go to college and you should even get a master's degree so that you might have something to fall back on in case something happens to your husband. And when I said, I'd like to have a, a real profession answer, who's going to take care of the children? Anyway, so yes, it was, my father inspired me, Dr. King inspired me, and I had wonderful professors in college who inspired me. And, uh, and I was really gripped by the history of biblical scholarship and German Jewish thought. So that's my field and my research. Is there a particular aspect of your father's life you wish was better well known, uh, Susanna? Particular thing that you, you just wish the public knew more about uh, that part of him? You know, it's actually the truth is, I think a lot of people who write about my father uh, have very, either they're secular or they're not Jewish or they're Jewish but not very religious and they don't understand my father's closeness to our Hasidic family. And my father was on the phone all the time with his brother-in-law who was a Rebbe. This was our family. So people have written things that um, show a lack of understanding of that, of the piety, the religiosity. Uh, and so I would like people to understand that. I'd like them to understand Hasidism better because there's so many cliches and, you know, movies that have come out that film on Netflix, unorthodox, or the woman leaves the Hasidic world, it's so terrible and so on. Okay, not everything is for everyone, but the spirit that nurtured my father was a Hasidic spirit. And that was deeply important to him always. Uh, Martin, when you were doing the film, what, what did you come to admire the most about uh, Rabbi Heschel? I imagine many things, but there's something that stood out that as you got to know more and more about him that you came to admire the most. Well, I guess the, the short answer to that, uh, Theo, would be what, what I saw as a lack of, a lack of uh, anger and revenge uh, in, from a man who had every reason to be angry and vengeful about what had happened to him in his life. I mean, to to see the loss that he saw personally, uh, professional, professionally have to uproot himself and, and leave Europe and come to the United States or be thrown into the American, the American culture, which was a shock for him. And yet to carry the burden of all that he had known that was going on before the loss of a mother and three sisters and, and the devastation. And yet, you know, to read him, there's hope written in between every single line. And to, and to me, that's, uh, it's, not, it's not just a cheap hope, it's an actually a hope that's grounded out of what could have been anger and frustration and vengeance. And yet it's all there, book after book. He's an incredibly prolific writer. I, I look at the 1950s with Abraham Heschel. This is only a handful of years after he's come to the United States and the war is over. 
Um, and the tragedy of what actually was going on in Europe has now finally been re being revealed. And yet he enters one of the most prolific times in his career, the 1950s. He's writing Man is Not Alone and uh, God in Search of Man, The Sabbath, all these incredible pieces of timeless works are coming out. And there's no real anger and vengeance in any of it. In fact, it's just a love and a try to, to understand when everybody else is asked, believing that God had abandoned the Jewish people, he's coming up with a different way to, to look at that. And I, I think that to me was just remarkable. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I just yeah. would add it. You're so right, Martin, what you just said. I would also add that my father was never depressed. He was never moody. He was never withdrawn. He was enthusiastic and always present, present in the moment. And he knew how to celebrate. He also had a wonderful sense of humor and he could be very playful. So I just want you to, I want to add that. To the and, you know, and not, and what I value that is, you know, you do a lot of, I've done a lot of films, I've got 35 films now over the years, you meet a lot of people and a lot of celebrated people I've had the privilege of meeting. And you learn somewhere down the line that they in fact have uh, polar identities meaning that uh, they have a public personality that they offer to everyone that may be joyous and happy and positive and uplifting, but behind closed doors, it's anything but. And then to hear Susanna say, no, I, actually, you didn't see a line being drawn between the father's personality, but he, was, he had a, a sense of hope and positiveness about him yes. all the time. And that, that, to me, I think is really remarkable. Yes. And, and particularly interesting in light of several points in the film, and uh, you said it, Susanna and others, about how your father was attacked for... And, you know, we look back at the civil rights era and the people who protested against the war in Vietnam and oh, we think how so how noble and how right. But a lot of people don't understand how controversial that was. Uh, how, how, how did he deal with that? I and mean, was it just this general attitude he had or and how did, did, did it have what kind of impact did it have on him when he was attacked like that? Well, he believed very strongly that what he was doing was the right thing. And yes, he was isolated and he was attacked. I think what, what would hurt him in, in, in his heart was when some of his colleagues at the Jewish Theological Seminary would make a nasty remark about his scholarship, about his writing. Uh, my father told me, don't go into academic life. It's just... <laughs> too mean-spirited uh, and it was and that's that would be times when he really was hurt uh, but he was you know he was sleepless over Vietnam he was not sleepless when someone tried to defend the war yeah. he was horrified yeah. yeah the film talks about some of the close relationships he uh, had with Protestant theologians and how important they were uh, I spent a year at Union Theological Seminary myself, so I know some of that community. And actually, he was, I think, at Jewish Theological at the time. But say a little bit about that. That evidently was very important and personally also, I guess, particularly in light of the history of Judaism and Christianity in Europe, which had been so ugly for so long. Just uh, comment a bit more about that and the impact it had on him. Well, you know, his doctoral dissertation was on the prophets. And in that dissertation, he was very critical of German scholarship on the prophets. Uh, and I, I can say more about that, but uh, I've written about the history of that. But in the United States, he came and then Reinhold Niebuhr wrote a beautiful review of Man is Not Alone. And they became very good friends. So when I was a child, I, I, my father and, and Reinhold Niebuhr would take walks in Riverside Park. And Reinhold Niebuhr was very tall and distinctive. And sometimes we, my father and I would be walking in the neighborhood and we would see Professor Niebuhr nearby. My father would point him out to me and tell me this is a very great person. And I remember once in, a, in school, in the history class, a teacher was trying to explain to us social classes, lower class, middle class, upper class. And I raised my hand and I said, upper class, wouldn't that be Reinhold Niebuhr? Because he was so elevated uh, and respected. And then there was W.D. Davies, who was a professor at Union Seminary, who was one of my father's closest friends. I think actually a father had really wonderful friends at Union Seminary and the faculty were warm and, and really um, established a nice community that my father did not have at the Jewish Theological Seminary, unfortunately. There was always tension and yeah. 
how, is, how would you say um, yeah, your father is um, remembered these days in the various Jewish communities, uh, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, uh, hard to generalize perhaps about all of that, but in general, um, what, what would you say about how his, his legacy is seen by American Jews? Well, often <laughs> his relationship with Dr. King is remembered. I, rem I remember nobody was approving of that in the Jewish community until I guess around the 1980s at some point. All of a sudden, my father marching with Dr. King and Selma became a photograph that people liked. You know, my feeling is that photograph has to be a challenge. It shouldn't be something you're proud of. It should be a challenge to you because look what's happened now. Voting Rights Act, that was being celebrated at Selma. And now the Supreme Court eviscerated it. And now look what the various state legislatures around the country are doing. So what, however much my father is admired in Jewish communities, it's not enough. Yes, yes, he's admired probably more in the reform movement than the other two movements. I think the conservative movement is not very strong right now. I think if they would understand my father better, it might help revitalize the Orthodox community. My father, I don't think, was ever invited to speak at an Orthodox synagogue because he was a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And people didn't understand that all the professors were refugee scholars from Europe, and they were all Orthodox, what people like to call strictly Orthodox, and I would say lovingly Orthodox. But at any rate, it's, um, there are some unfortunate misunderstandings. Do you have, uh, Susanna, a particular favorite book or work from your father that you would mention or talk about or say why it's a favorite? Well, you know, it's that's hard to say. When I was very young, when I was about seven, I was in third grade and I started reading The Earth is the Lord's and I thought, I know this already because so much of the book I had heard my father talk about I, in lectures or at the dinner table, the stories. Um, so I, but I love that book. I love that book. I love when he says in that book <sighs> that at Mount Sinai, Israel had a revelation of God. And in the days of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, God had a revelation of Israel. That I think is a wonderful, and it captures so much of what Martin said a few minutes ago, you know, in the discussion about yeah, God's perspective on us. So, but I love the Sabbath, the book, the Sabbath is beautiful. I love the book on the prophets. I love what he says there because it just completely shatters what everybody else was saying about the prophets. You know, Aaron Strelch gave a lecture in 1915 where he said the prophets were, were from little villages and then they would come to the urban center and where there's a, a monarch and an economy and a military and they would say, turn your swords into plowshares. And what nonsense, Trelch said. What? They were country bumpkins. They were so, so ignorant. And you know, here my father comes and speaks about the passion of the prophets and God's pathos and God responding to us and suffering with us. It's so completely different. It's such a different world. And, and of course, I love, I love what he says in Man is Not Alone when he says, you know, you, he's quoting here the Kutzka Rebbe, Hasidic Rebbe. He says, you can't try to be religious like your grandparents because that would be spiritual plagiarism. Your religion has to be authentic to who you are. And I love that, spiritual plagiarism. Yeah, yeah it's a great phrase. <laughs> I was just gonna add, uh, Theo, that um, yeah. I think if I've learned anything in, in doing biographies, religious biographies now over so many years, is that these figures that we remember so fondly, um, they need champions. How easily it would have been for certain figures that we now revere to be lost to history. And I'm thinking, first of all, about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Had it not been for, the, for Eberhard Beitke, who I had the privilege of knowing and spending time with Eberhard Beitke, who was always reinterpreting Bonhoeffer's theology, putting it back out there, doing all the changes of theology that were happening year after year, 
Um, that, that championing of that character, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I think really made it possible for the next generation to pick up on Bonhoeffer and continue. I think Susanna Heschel is doing the exact same thing for her father. She is the one. Look at all these reprints of all of Heschel's classics. And she's the one who's writing the new forwards, writing the new material, writing the reviews, writing the interpretations of them and everything, trying always to find ways to make sure that her father is understood and seen with contemporary eyes so that, that it's not just an historical evaluation, but actually taking that material and making it relative for us today. So she's really doing that kind of heavy lifting day in and day out for her father's legacy. Thank you, Martin. I have to tell you that I also knew Eberhard Becke and my father and I read his biography as soon as it was translated into English. I ran to the bookstore and brought it home and my father grabbed it and he wanted to read it first. And what's so interesting about that first biography, big, thick biography, that he doesn't talk about the Holocaust or it just, just doesn't. And it was only after Becke came on a lecture tour and he came to Harvard Divinity School, where I was a student, actually, and students asked him, well, what about what did Bonhoeffer say about what was happening to the Jews? And then all of a sudden, Betka started talking about what Bonhoeffer had said and how important this was and so on. So I think what's important, Martin, your film is important because you are raising questions as we raise questions to Betka that make us see new dimensions of my father's life. The questions that people ask are so important. And they were important to my father. When people asked at a lecture, what do you think of something? And it was good for him. What do you think about gay rights, they asked him. And he was able to speak out at that point. I, I'm curious to hear what he said about that. Oh, absolutely. Who do you think started the orange on the Seder plate and why? Okay. That's I mean, an orange on the Seder plate out of solidarity with gay men and lesbians. Yeah. So no homophobia in my father, I can tell you. In a moment, we want to, we've got some questions that have come in and we want to take some of them and uh, respond to those. I guess as a final question, I'd ask uh, uh, Martin and then maybe a, a you too, Susanna, you know, based on your time doing the film, Martin, what, do, what would you say to someone if they ask you to summarize uh, fairly briefly, what uh, Rabbi Heschel's greatest legacy is. Uh, I, I think it's easy to see um, uh, Rabbi Heschel as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, most important Jewish figure of the 20th century. I think he's bigger than that. I think he's he's a he's one of the most important religious figures of the 20th century. But I think he's also a uniquely American figure of the 20th century. I mean, this is a person who comes to the United States at in 1940, 33 years old as he, as he comes. And a lot of new immigrants come to this country and they are very anxious and shy about how they're going to integrate. Uh, within a certain, within a short period of time, um, Heschel finds his, his legs. He's writing, he's publishing, he's making his decisions about uh, which side of history do I wanna be on? And now looking at looking back and seeing what he did, he won. I think in my mind, he winds up on the right side of history all the time. And so I think he ultimately becomes one new chapter in the great American story. He's just a really remarkable chapter for that. You want to briefly add anything about what you think is his most important legacy, Susanna, and then we'll take some other questions here. Well, I, I, I agree with Martin. Uh, I think my father inspires people. And that I know would make him happy. So there are those who read his work or hear about him or see Martin's film and they feel inspired and they feel also, I think, um, accompanied by him, understood by him and given courage by him. I think so often for me and for many others who read my father's books, they feel he's speaking. I feel he's speaking to me in that moment. People feel understood by him. And that's, I think, because he had such a tremendous depth as a human being. He was so full of understanding and unafraid of emotions, whether joy or sorrow. I could go to him with any, anything, any problem. And he understood the empathy was enormous that he had. So that's a legacy to be spoken to by his work to be inspired. I'll add one more thing that's yeah, just yeah. To me during the course of the making of the film that I, that I never forgot. Um, Cause you, you know, we, as we're making these films, we, uh, 
we sometimes go home at the end of the day and think, well, how much, how much progress did we make today? We probably didn't get more than a minute done, maybe 30 seconds of the, of the thing. God, this is gonna take forever to make this film. And, and I remember so clearly, Susanna, you said to me that one day your father came home and you or your mother asked him, how was your day? And he said, I wrote one good sentence. Yes. And this is a writer whose volumes now just an enormous body of work to think that he was proud of that one good sentence. And I think for everybody out there uh, in America today, we, we know that we've lost the skill of writing well. We're down to texts and quick messages with the skill of really writing well, I think uh, has been, is being lost in America. But I think to read Heschel is a reminder that it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort and commitment to write well, but he did exactly that. I think also what he meant was it was a beautiful sentence, a meaningful sentence. And maybe we also need to pause at times and say, I created a beautiful day in my life today. And yeah, you know, the phrase, uh, an artist made a, a little plaque and uh, a friend of mine, Parak O'Hare gave me, it says to be, just to be is holy. Yeah, just to be is a blessing, just to live is holy. So life is about time. What do we do with our time? How do we create Sabbath? Yeah. So yes, right. Martin, even if you made only 30 seconds of the film that day, <laughs> it was beautiful. You don't have TV yeah. saying, when is it going to be ready? When is it going to be ready? When is it they weren't satisfied by the comment that you'd made one minute progress. Yeah, just one minute today. <laughs> Leave me alone. Right? No, no, they, they want the film delivered. So, so let's look at some of the questions that have come in. Uh, there are a few about, you know, trying to think about what Rabbi Heschel would say today, which is always difficult, but always also helpful to think about a little bit. Uh, Josh Jacobs Veldi uh, writes, uh, how do you think Rabbi Heschel would respond to Black Lives Matter, the calls to defund the police, the broader movement of racial justice today. General comments about that, uh, uh, Susanna, and then if you wanna add anything on that, Martin. Uh, I, I, my father would be marching with Black Lives Matter as he marched in Selma as well. Uh, I, I wanna say that the slogan, defund the police is being manipulated. The point of it is we cannot expect the police to handle all kinds of problems, crises that we have if we are if we if fall down the stairs or we're having a nervous breakdown or if someone has lost their their dog or their wallet or or there's someone with a gun in front of me all of these social issues that we hand over to the police and we give them a lot of money and we see what's happening uh, so the police need to be relieved of this burden and our society needs to organize itself more appropriately and the violence and the murder by the police, imagine what that means. Imagine what it means to be a black person in this country and have to live in fear that a police can stop you and shoot you dead with a gun, just like that. What is that, what kind of a society is this? So of course my father would be marching. There's another question um, from Mindy Reiser. Um, uh, what did Rabbi Heschel have to say about the role of women in Judaism? And, did he speak to special responsibilities they have? And, and did he have any words about the feminist movement that was really just beginning to take off uh, near the end of his life? My uh, father had the great gift of having a daughter who was born a feminist. So my father, I, I, mean, I would say my father, you say that study of religious texts is so important, prayer is so important, so why do I have to sit behind the curtain? Why is it in my Orthodox day school, Ramaz, the boys were preparing for the bar mitzvahs and the girls were sent downstairs to take sewing lessons? What is this? And my father said, you're right, things have to change. I wanted a bat mitzvah, not just a little party, and I wanted it on Shabbat morning. And my father organized the whole thing for me. My father said to me, why don't you become a rabbi? I said, I don't think they'll take women. He said, things are changing. So <laughs> my father supported me 100%. Great. Uh, there's another question about, a um, um, couple of questions about uh, his views on Israel um, and uh, uh, one person, Gail Berniford, writes about uh, um, 
what is what would his reaction be to sort of the oppression of Arabs and the removal of Christians and Muslims from the land? And did did he comment on uh, the, the um, behavior of Israel and its policies? Was he troubled by those kinds of actions? Uh, what he had seen up to that point in his life um, by 1972. You know, I just want to give. Uh, we'll, we'll let um, Susanna take the, the heavy lifting here on this one. But I just want to say, from an historical point of view, we're so inclined and too often inclined to ask what historical characters would have thought about a particular yeah, thing, right. and and their view is all is defined. He, he, Heschel dies in 1972. And how different the situation is in Israel has been now for these last 50 years. So you can project, conject, whatever it is you think that he might be thinking. Uh, but his, I, I think uh, this is one of the most tricky and complicated questions that has come up. It's come up in every every event that we did. I, I love. I'm reading right now. I'm rereading um, uh, Israel: Echo of, of Eternity, and I just think it's a, one of the most prosaic books I've come across in a long time. It's just a masterful piece of work. You mean poetic? Poetic, so yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Poetic. Uh, yes, it is, it's a beautiful book that he wrote after 67, after the war. Um, so first of all, look, I, it's clear, my father supported McGovern, for example, uh, actively and gave speeches with McGovern and so on. My father would not be a right-wing person, although some of his so-called disciples like to think that my father would have changed his mind and become a right-wing Republican and joined them. That makes no sense. So my father was concerned about Palestinians uh, in his own day, before he died, we talked about it. He was also uh, appalled by the, uh, the efforts of the PLO, what they were doing, hijacking planes and murdering Israeli athletes by Black September at the Munich Olympics. That, it was horrific. So yes, the situation was also different at that time. Uh, and I, I don't, uh, I think my father today would certainly feel as, uh, as we all do that what, what is, what is the point? What are they trying to do in Israel to push a Palestinians out of their homes to have a, a, a Jewish only country? What is that? I think that what's going on with, in Israel with one prime minister and the president actually going to jail for corruption, one for rape, uh, there is something quite awful. And my father, who was invited to lecture in Israel by President Zalman Shazar, who was a childhood friend, to lecture about Jewish values. My father felt very strongly that Israel often behaved as if it were exile. It was gullus. This was not how, this, there were no Jewish values. You know, for example, celebrating Israel's Independence Day with jet planes and tanks through the streets, that, that, that's not Jewish. It's not Jewish value in his uh, perspective. So uh, I, I, he would, I think, be quite appalled that the village of Issaouia outside the uh, Hebrew University in Mount Scopus they're trying to push people out, what's going on in Silwan, what goes on in the South Hebron Hills, what's being done to Bedouin? What, Bedouin? Why? Bedouin can't live as Bedouin? What, what are they trying to do? Uh, I, I think he would feel that the Israeli government as it is right now has abandoned Jewish values. He would have been appalled by the racism that exists in Israel as well as among Palestinians. And one of the most dangerous things is when a political conflict becomes racialized, then what? Then it becomes very difficult to make any kind of peace. So my father would not, and he did say, we do not worship the soil and that movement to take land. No, my father would have said, peace is far more important. Human life is far more important than land. So he, I think he would have been very appalled by the direction that Israel has taken. And he would have been appalled by some of the, by the direction that the Palestinian so-called liberation organization took. That's neither side seems to be interested in making peace. One question of kind of clarification about something you talked about earlier. Someone asked, could you just say something brief as a, explaining what Hasidism uh, means? Uh, you made reference to it and wish people understood the spirit of it more. Just if you could for a, 
uh, sure. someone not so, familiar with it, define yes, that. Sorry, yeah. Of course. So Hasidism was, means pietism, and it was a movement that began in Eastern Europe in the late 18th century uh, of trying to reinvigorate Judaism with joy and enthusiasm, with prayer, with passion, uh, dancing as a form of prayer, but even, even eating and walking and how making love should also be religious. Uh, so trying to infuse one's whole life, one's body and one's daily life in the most quotidian way with piety and with joy. Piety means joy, praise of God. And Hasidic texts were written that try to also infuse us with joy and that are also very deeply inward looking in, in a psychological, emotional sense sensitive to us and our sensitivities. I could say more, but I know you no, have that's to good. I think that's the kind of <laughs> clarification folks were looking for. There are a couple of questions more personal, Susanna, about just uh, growing up with him as your father. Uh, you've talked about a little bit about the joy he brought to everything and ways he supported you, but there's a general question about what was it like having him as a father What's your favorite memory, or is there a type of favorite memory? Just speak to that a little bit, if you would. So, yeah. Um, you know, when I was little, my father really didn't have a childhood. He was always studying when he was a little boy, didn't have toys. So he actually enjoyed playing with me and my toys. And we um, we would get down on the floor and play zoo and pretend we were animals. When I was older, he taught me to play chess. My father and mother played Chinese checkers in the evenings. My father liked uh, playing hide and seek with me and also liked to play tricks on my mother. The two of us would do that and we got great joy out of um, startling her or hiding from her or things like that. And we would just laugh and laugh. And, <laughs> and when my father would publish a book, my mother and I would go to the bakery and get a little cupcake and put a candle on it to celebrate. Um, and, <laughs> uh, but I also would say that when my father would come home in the afternoon, in the evening for dinner, he just filled the house with enthusiasm. And then often after dinner, he would go back to his study at the seminary and then it would be my bedtime and I would lie in bed and I could never fall asleep. And my father would come home around 11 o'clock and I would hear his key in the door and I would call out to him. And my mother was wanting me to go to sleep, but my father would immediately come rushing into my bedroom and I would kiss him. And I remember how cold his cheeks were in the winter months and he would hug and kiss me. And sometimes I would cry, I would cry because I was short. I was so short and I didn't want to be short. I was the smallest one in my class and my father would comfort me. And sometimes he would try to cheer me up by saying something funny. And so for example, he would say, should I get you fried ice cream? Because how can you fry ice cream? You know, things like that. And so he could be very warm and sweet and loving and, and funny. And of course that always made me laugh until I went to Japan and discovered that in Japan, they actually do have something called fried ice cream. And I wish I could tell him. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those for intimate moments. Those are, those are really beautiful. Um, two of the phrases that struck me most in the film uh, that I'd just like you both to comment on a little bit. Um, one speaker said that the key idea in all of his um, theology was God cares. And then the other phrase about the other key concept, the moral consequences of indifference. I just found those both very powerful uh, phrases and would just like to hear both of you talk a little bit about that and, 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 and what that means and maybe lessons for us you know, in those, in those things. Um, well, I, I guess I'll start and say that that's the that's the line, the the, the whole notion of uh, the moral consequences of indifference. That's the that's the concept. That's the idea that I think has lasted with me throughout the course of the whole making of the film. We all uh, when we ever we start a film, we always like to put posted notes on the wall. What are going to be the themes that you really sort of want to continue to reverberate throughout the course of the film? Uh, and from a theological and the social point of view, I thought the whole notion of uh, that there are consequences to indifference, that to, to do nothing is to, do, to, to make a decision. 
And I think that reverberates throughout the course of Heschel's life and writings. And uh, we talked again and again. So if you watch the film, there are many points at which we raise that whole question of the consequences of indifference. And so it's in a sense a, cl a clarion call to all of us to take responsibility for what, we're, what we see, what we're witnesses to. We're witnessing now in this country, again, new kinds of injustice that actually harken back to, to uh, two generations ago and even earlier than that. And we have to be aware of that and we have to we have to make our decision. We can't stand idly on the side. And I think that's one of the things you have to respect about Heschel. He, he was not gonna stand aside and watch this happen and not do something about it. Zen, what would you add to that? Yes, I thought that was great, what Martin just said. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I might just add that um, my father was, uh, my father carried his concern for, for Vietnam uh, and for racism in this country also to his daily life. So sometimes if I would go with him to a, a grocery store, let's say, he, the way he would talk to them, the way he would talk to the cashier, sometimes there would be some, somebody working there or someone who was not in a good mood um, he always responded in a way trying to cheer the person up, make them feel better. Once he went with William Sloan Coffin, Coffin's car had been towed and they had to go and get it. And they, the guard at this huge, huge lot filled with towed cars in New York City. And the guard was really grumpy and Coffin went off to get his car and my father stayed with this guard. And Bill Coffin said when he came back, the guard was laughing and talking and so on. So this ability to transform, which I think really is so important to have that talent to transform, to make somebody happy, to transform a mood, to transform hardened hearts and soften them with the words of the prophets, but with his being, with his personality, that's who my father was. I, I, I watched that and I thought that was wonderful. I think that's, I, I would say that was what it meant to him to be a rabbi in the Hasidic tradition, to transform people. And I think actually one could say in Christian terms, that's when the Holy Spirit is coming through in the community and coming through a person we, in some say, you might say, channel the Holy Spirit. We bring the Holy Spirit into that moment. Am I, I hope I'm expressing that in, in a Christian sense. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, one of the things I would add, I think what, what I think you're saying though, uh, without using this language, is that despite the fact that your father was an academic at heart, he was an academic person, uh, he had the heart of a pastor. He was, a, he was, there was a pastoral side to your father yes. uh, that didn't really always have the, the, uh, the vehicle, the, the mechanism to be able to express to, him, uh, to his people because mm -hmm. his, his congregation would be the student body, the small student body that was there at the, at, the, but he, at the school. But he had that pastoral sense about him as well that was sort of dying to be expressed and to get out into the world in addition to this academic side. That's right, exactly. You're near the end of time, and uh, we are going to, in a moment, um, play this recording uh, from 1967 from Rabbi Heschel. Let that be the benediction for our time. But I want to ask one just final question for comment for the two of you. A lot of the people watching this um, uh, webinar involved in the work in our congregation and other congregations that we work with are activists in various ways working for peace and justice. And uh, um, what, what lessons are there? We've talked about it a little bit, but what summary lessons would you say there are from um, a, a message from his life or summary lessons from his life that those of us who work for peace and justice should carry with us or can, can take with us, it would be helpful. Well, I'll, I'll start it by saying that um, I think it's really extraordinary this evening that you have Susanna here tonight 
And you had her father there at New York Avenue Presbyterian now, you know, 50 some years ago, because New York Avenue Presbyterian Church was then as it is now on the forefront of all the social questions that are being raised right adjacent to the White House, right in the heart of the Capitol. And her father brings Martin, her and Martin Luther King come to speak there because they knew that this was an important place to have their voices heard. And that I think is the, the, the key message that you've already established the church for now for generations as a place that it was interested in the important social justice issues of their time and continue to be for our time. And that continues to resonate. Ultimately, we're making history every day. And the fundamental decision we have to make is what side of history do we want to be on? And I think Abraham Heschel was pretty clear about what side of history he was, he was willing to take the risk to be on. Susanna, a final word uh, that you want to offer? Uh, I, I so much agree, Martin, with what you just said. Uh, I, I would just uh, add that I think sometimes it can be difficult for us. We feel overwhelmed. And one of the things that um, my father always would say, and this is a Jewish tradition, never despair, never despair. Despair is forbidden. Despair comes when you think that God is not all around us, but God is present and with us. So there's no reason to despair. And in fact, he would say, God never gives us a task without also giving us the ability to accomplish it. I think sometimes we just need a little bit of encouragement and refreshment of the soul and the spirit. And that's why it's important, well, important for us to go to church, to go to synagogue, to be with friends, or to read this book and one of my father's books and watch this film and receive a bit of inspiration. And so I think that's his, his lasting legacy to give us that nourishment. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you, for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been a great discussion, uh, mm -hmm. and um, I just, again, appreciate uh, the film so much. And Susanna, you're joining us tonight. Uh, as we draw to a close, I, I have two very quick announcements, and then we're going to play a benediction um, that I have mentioned earlier. Um, recordings of all of our McClendon Scholar programs are available on our website. You see it there. Um, a Clinton Scholar in Residence program, uh, uh, nyapc.org slash mcclendon sir, and a recording of this program will be up on that website soon also. If you want to review it again uh, or share with others who may have missed this. Uh, and also just to let you know, we um, are finalizing plans for scholars. We'll be hosting this summer and fall, and we'll keep you posted on all of our upcoming programs you'll be hearing from us via email and through other announcements. For our invocation, when we began, I read a portion of a prayer that Abraham Joshua Heschel gave at our church back in 1967. And for our benediction, we want to play a recording of the final three minutes of his uh, remarkable talk that he gave that day. So I want to thank all of you for being with us this evening, and we will now give the final word to Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. This assembly perhaps should have been held not in our beautiful capital, but rather in the devastated villages of Vietnam. For God is present wherever men are afflicted, where is God present now? We do not know how to cry. We don't know how to pray. Our conscience is so timid. Our words so faint. Our mercy so feeble. We have no adequate mercy. So Father in heaven, have mercy upon us. Our God, add our cries uttered here to the cries of the bereaved, crippled and dying over there. Have mercy upon all of us. 
help us to overcome the arrogance of power, guide and inspire the President of the United States in finding a speedy, generous, peaceful end to the war in Vietnam. The intensity of the agony is high, the hour is late, the outrage may reach a stage when repentance may be too late. Repair beyond any nation's power. Just a brief story of a boy of seven who was reading with his teacher the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. And the boy records, Abraham was leading his boy Isaac to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed. My heart was throbbing in anguish. Isaac is now bound, lying on the woods, about to be sacrificed. In the hall, Abraham is lifting his knife. But then the angel appeared, don't touch the boy. I burst out in tears. My teacher asked me, why do you cry? Isaac was saved. Rabbi, the child responded, the angel could have been one moment late. So the rabbi said to him, an angel is never late. An angel can't be late, but man inflicted with pride and vanity can be late. Every hour comes. Let us pray that the agony be no more extended, that our guilt be no more deepened. We pray for a covenant of peace, for reconciliation of America and all of Vietnam. To paraphrase the words of the prophet Isaiah, for Vietnam's sake, I will not keep silent. For America's sake, I will not rest until the vindication of humanity goes forth as brightness and peace for all men is a burning torch. Amen.